if we listen, brothers and sisters, to hymns of Pascha and to the life portion of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the spiritual place of the myrrh-bearing women cannot possibly escape our attention. And of all the hymns which we might mention in connection with this thought, I want to highlight just one especially for you today, taken from Paschal Matins, which says the following. The myrrh-bearing women at early drop dawn drew near to the tomb of the life-giver and found an angel sitting on the stone. And speaking to them, he said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you mourn the incorruptible one amid corruption? Go, proclaim this to his apostles. Go, brothers and sisters, and proclaim this to his apostles, was the angel's command to the myrrh-bearers. Though women cannot be ordained to the holy priesthood, keeping the order which Christ himself has established and given to us in his selection of the holy apostles, and though women are not permitted to preach specifically at our services, yet drawing from the example of the myrrh-bearers who brought the glad tidings of joy to the apostles, we indeed confess that women can become teachers and instructors in the spiritual life. Though she cannot baptize, the woman can indeed lead others to accept baptism. Though she cannot absolve, she can indeed teach others how to find and confess their sins. Though she can't give Holy Communion, she can indeed teach about the importance of the mystery and show others how to prepare themselves properly for it. In other words, the sacramental priesthood is one thing. This is only transmitted to men by the laying on of hands by an Orthodox bishop. But the spiritual priesthood, the ability to draw people towards salvation, towards the sacramental priesthood, this indeed belongs to all who have successfully struggled to acquire grace and union with God, whether they are ordained or not, whether they are men or women. As the ever-memorable Father John Romanides once wrote, such healed people automatically and implicitly become doctors for others whose souls are sick. It is inconceivable for one who has been healed, whether a priest or a monk, whether a man or a woman, not to have spiritual children, that is to say, other people whom he or she advises and leads toward spiritual healing. And one of these mothers of the church, of whom we have just spoken, is Yerontsa, or Eldress Macrina, at one time the abbess of the holy monastery of Panagia Oligitria, outside the Greek city of Volos. This past year, a collection of her talks delivered to her nuns and to pious pilgrims visiting her monastery has been published, and so given this fact, I decided that this being a theme year, we of course, as you all know very well now, preach on a three-year cycle, um, beginning with the Sunday after Pascha, the first year we do the Gospels, the second year we treat the Epistles according to the Holy Fathers, and the third year we uh, preach on a particular theme. And so because this is the theme year, and because uh, this wonderful collection of Yerons and Macrina's talks has been published, I've decided to take this year and present you her teachings concerning the spiritual life um, over this next year, over this coming year, thereby joining our small parish to the great chorus of souls who have received spiritual benefit from this holy women. Uh, of a holy woman, rather, of our times. And as we always do, we're going to begin this year-long course of homilies today by looking specifically at Yerontis' life, pointing out here and there some things that are of particular benefit to us. Yerontis Macrina, then. Yerontis Macrina was born uh, Maria Vesopoulou, parents in a Greek village in Asia Minor, which is today uh, the western part of Turkey. But her birth in 1921 coincided with a major event called the Exchange of Populations, wherein all the Greeks living in Turkey forcibly sent back to Greece, uh, literally with only what they could carry, since a good chunk of this way was made on foot. So as a six-month-old, Hironsa was carried from her homeland to a city called Volos. All the while, impious people trying to convince her parents to simply throw her into the sea or abandon her on account of the difficulty of the journey and the poverty that awaited them all when they arrived in their new homeland. Her parents, however, resisted this temptation, valuing life as authentic Christians. In Volus, Yeronsa started school. 
And though she was smart and indeed loved learning, she excelled in her classes, she loved God more than studies. And one day, while she was at play with her fellow students, she asked them to break from, her pl from their play so that they could stop and pray together. But in the midst of her prayer, she was overcome with the love of God and began to weep so forcefully that she, rather than stay in school, had to run home and into the arms of her parents. Naturally, seeing the sight, her parents asked her what was wrong, and she responded, I want to become a nun. I want to be with Christ. Now, her parents were greatly surprised by this, because she had had, to this point in her life, almost no exposure to monasticism and monastics. But her pious uh, father, neither pushing her towards monasticism, nor trying to dissuade her from it, on the other hand, simply said, Then, may you be a good nun, my child. Now this, brothers and sisters, is a very important point we'll make in passing. Sometimes pious parents try to push their children to become monks or nuns, forgetting that this is a divine calling. And on the other hand, sometimes impious parents who wear the mask of piety try to dissuade their children from becoming monastics because they hold in their hearts worldly aspirations for them. Geronis' parents, though, as we've said, were a good example. They neither pushed her but neither did they get in her way. Now this supportive, ideal family environment was soon lost to Geronsa. Since in 1929, 1930, both of her parents were posed just months apart. Not yet ten then, she became an orphan, which was a very precarious place to be in an era with extreme poverty and no social structures. But she embraced her soon new situation with faith in God's protection, and she went out and got a job, working most notably at a cigarette packing plant, uh, where she didn't let her work distract her from prayer, just as she had maintained her piety within her school environment. At the beginning of her workday, she'd say to the Theotokos, I will pray, and you will count cigarettes. And every single time the boxes that she packed uh, were checked by her employer, they would have just the right amount uh, in them. Say she had a thousand, she was supposed to have a thousand cigarettes in a box. Each and every box she produced would have a thousand cigarettes, even though she wasn't counting, even though she would say the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on me, and over and over again while she was putting uh, the cigarettes in the boxes. Um, in accordance with her prayer, the Theotokos would count while she prayed, the Theotokos counted, and the boxes came up right every single time. And though, even though she worked, she didn't have enough to cover her needs, Though she was hungry, do you know what she did with the first check she received, with her first paycheck? Most of us would take this uh, this big payday as an opportunity to buy something for ourselves, to, to treat ourselves. She instead gave the money she made from her first paycheck to the church and asked that services be offered for the souls of her parents. Now around this time, she had a second vision confirming her monastic call. Once, while she was at prayer, she saw the Theotokos carrying uh, the Christ child, and somehow Christ got down from the Most Holy Theotokos' arms and began to run away, but Yeronsa caught him and returned him to his Most Holy Mother, at which point the Theotokos took out two rings, put one on Christ's hand and the other on Yeronsa's, symbolizing that she would be betrothed to Christ in monasticism. Now the next years, which are the war years, uh, together with its occupations in Greece, were physically even more difficult, materially even more difficult for Yeronsa. Uh, though it should be noted that the often barbaric German and Italian soldiers became meek and soft towards her. They would sometimes carry heavy baskets as they saw her traveling and carrying uh, loads of things, or they might let her go to church, for example, even if she was out past curfew, when in other situations they'd be treated harshly or maybe even arrested. But in this period, despite the softness of the occupiers towards her sometimes, Yeronsa came very close to starvation. Even on one occasion particularly, she commended her soul to God. Um, that's how close she was to, to reposing. She never became angry with God, she never complained about her situation, she never even, for the most part, made her difficulties known to others. But yet, despite this, God continually provided for her, seeing her patience and her humility. For example, the weeds which she ate, which grew outside of her windows where she was staying, 
after being picked one day, when she would go out again the next day and look, they'd be fully grown back again so that she would have a meal again for the next day. So by miraculous means, he provided for her. But also, seeing her desired condition, the local parish priest put his community under an obedience to make sure that the now young woman had a loaf of bread on her window sill every single day. Materially and uh, physically, things improved for her after the war. And spiritually, she was given great consolation by a now group of pious young women who uh, shared her monastic desire and gathered around her. This group of young women began to live a sort of monastic life in anticipation of the vows which they would take even though they were still in the world, and they placed themselves under the direction of the well-known Elder Joseph the Hesychus from Mount Athos, corresponding with him as their spiritual father by means of letter. During this period, the group, uh, a particularly interesting story from this period, uh, has it that the group had each saved up enough money in order to go to pilgrimage in Jerusalem, to go to the Holy Land and visit the holy sites and venerate. But just before they were about to go, Gironza gave all her money away to a relative who was in need, and so her sisterhood was forced to go without her. But one night as they were away, uh, and Gironza was at prayer, an angel appeared to her and took her noetically, spiritually, to all of the holy sites one by one, so that she would not be deprived of the blessing on account of her great act of charity. And when she finally did go to Jerusalem physically for the first time in the 1970s, she actually led the group of nuns traveling with her from site to site, confirming for all and in plain sight that she had indeed been there before. She knew exactly where to go because the angel had escorted her previously. And so when she went for the first time in the 70s, she was able to lead the group of pilgrims from site to site uh, based on her vision uh, that she had previously received. So finally, in 1954, this group of spiritual sisters that had formed around her uh, were all tonsured, became nuns, and eventually they settled in uh, Porto Via, a place very close to the Greek city of Volos. And Elder Joseph appointed Gironsa Macrina to become abbess of this new sisterhood. But on account of her humility, she was indeed one of the younger of this new group of nuns, um, she initially had trouble accepting the appointment, even though it had been made by such a God-bearing and God-seeing elder. So the elder, rather than argue with her, began to pray, and eventually St. John the Baptist appeared to her and made her clear that this was indeed God's will, God's will that she should become abbess. And so she then accepted her appointment. Now during his her time as abbess, the monastery uh, of Panagia of the Gitria was characterized by an exemplary ascetic life. What does it mean for a monastery to be characterized by an exemplary ascetic life? It means that they excelled in fasting, in vigil, and in prayer, but also particularly in hospitality. They showed great love towards pilgrims and guests. Moreover, Yoransa loved the saints of her our day, and she sought out their advice in directing her sisterhood. And in turn, these saints whose advice she sought loved and respected her. And I want to give you a few of the examples of the love and respect that the saints of our day showed to Gironsa to give you a sense of her spiritual height. For example, Elder Ephraim of Katonakia. Generally, one of the trips when he was in hospital wasn't accepting visitors as he lay there receiving his treatment. But when he heard that Gironsa Macrina had come to visit him, he told his attendant, open wide the doors. In other words, he was very excited that Yoransa had come and received her even though he wasn't receiving um, others at the time. In addition, he once told a pilgrim that was visiting him in Katonakia on Mount Athos that when he prayed for the monastery in Porto Lia, he saw a shaft of light arising from it that went straight to the heavens. This, he explained to the pilgrim, the shaft of light was Yoransa's prayer. Also, we have examples coming from St. Pisces. St. Pisces the Athenite, upon meeting her, prostrated himself on the ground just as she did when the two came together. But he, however, refused to get up until after she did. He waited for her to get up, acknowledging the spiritual height of the woman who stood before him. Also, St. Iacobus, St. Iacobus Seleucus, recently canonized, referred to her as a mother of the church. 
and he said that if he lived in Volos, he would go and get her blessing every single day before he went to his work. Moreover, Yurans' monastery became a nursery for other monasteries. Sisters from her sisterhood populated four monasteries in Greece and two in America, and eventually more nuns from the Greek monasteries fed other monasteries in America and Canada. So, for example, the monasteries that we have uh, in Toronto, St. Cosma, and outside of Montreal, uh, in Chatham-Brownsburg, Panagia-Parigoritsa, these were fed out of the Greek monasteries that grew out of Eurantis' synodia. Now, in 1987, Yurantisa was diagnosed with colon cancer, and she bore her difficulties with great patience and humility. As her repro repose approached, she began to speak more and more about her desire to venerate the belt of the Theotokos, and in 1985, miraculously, it came from Vatopedi. She venerated it at her monastery, they brought it to her at her monastery, she venerated it, and she was heard to say, now that the belt has come, I will depart. And a few days later, suddenly she began calling all of her spiritual children by phone or summoning them to the monastery in order to give them her final word, as if she'd received information from God that indeed her repose was, was coming. She asked a priest to come lastly, and she asked him to sign her with the Holy Lance. The Holy Lance is the special uh, knife shaped like a spear, the spear particularly the pierced Christ's side, um, which the priest uses in the service of Proskimidi as he prepares the lamb to be used in the divine liturgy. Um, and there are prayers to be used when people are ill for them to be signed with this lance um, in their illness. And so Yeronsa asked for the priest to come and sign her with the holy lance. Then finally, on the 4th of June, 1995, uh, she reposed peacefully. And her body exuded a sweet fragrance from the time of her repose until the time of her burial. So this then, brothers and sisters, is the great pillar who will be our teacher over the next year. May we have her blessing as we try to learn and apply her teachings in our lives, and so be brought closer to our Lord God and Savior, Christ. Amen.